This is Adam Rothberg. I'm really excited to have our guest, Jeanette Walls, in the studio with us today. If you've spent any time in a bookstore over the last few years or looked at the bestseller list, then you've surely come across The Glass Castle, her critically acclaimed memoir of her unusual family and her unorthodox upbringing in the American West and the coal mining country of West Virginia. Jeanette's new book, Half Broke Horses, is out this month. Welcome to Off the Shelf. Thanks for having me here. Jeanette, let's start with what the book actually is. On the cover, it's called A True Life Novel, which isn't a label that gets applied to books very frequently. Mm -hmm. Can you explain Mm -hmm. for our listeners a little bit about how you came to that appellation? Well, uh, it's the story of my grandmother, Lily Casey Smith, um, who died when I was eight years old. I'd originally intended to write the book about my mother at the suggestions of readers. I've, I've been touring a lot on behalf of the Glass Castle, and people kept asking me questions about my mother. They said, your father, I understand. Your mother is a mystery to me. So we chat a little bit about my mom, and usually these conversations would end with the advice, your next book should be about your mother. But while I was interviewing my mother, she kept ins- on insisting that the book should be about her her mother. And at first I resisted, but I ultimately did go ahead and make it about my grandmother. But I couldn't interview my my grandmother because she died when I was eight. Um, And um, I had to fill in little gaps of things that I wasn't certain about or make these assumptions. Plus, I wrote it in first person from Lily's perspective. So I think I said across the line, even though it's, it's as true as I can possibly get it, I don't know. I can't fact check it. There aren't written records. So it's just a family story, like most folks out there have that are handed down by their parents and grandparents. And um, it's, it's, it's sort of an American story um, about just this, this tough old broad who did what she needed to be done, uh, what needed to be done to, to make things work. So it's, It's as close as I could get it to the truth, but I can't say that it's nonfiction. So we called it a true life novel. And there are actually some rather famous precedents for that, aren't there? Yeah, uh, uh, Norman Mailer's Executioner Song was called a true life novel, and it was written largely, I mean, almost entirely from transcripts of people involved in the Gary Gilmore case. So it's not like we're making things up from whole cloth or tarting things up. Or um, Some people have asked me why I fictionalized the story. It's less fictionalizing it is than sort of dramatizing it in the way that that movies often are. You know, if you're making a movie about Queen Elizabeth, for example, you don't know exactly what outfit she was wearing or when she scratched her head. You just sort of fill in the gaps and use the tools of of fiction to tell a story. Now, how far down the road did you get with your mother trying to write her book before you switched gears to your grandmother? I started writing the book about about my mother. I started writing it in her voice. Um, my mother is motivated by very different things than I am. She's she's an interesting lady. Some people who read The Glass Castle think that she's a villain and should have been locked up and had her children taken away from her. Some people think that she's a certainly a flawed person, but also had great gifts. And I sort of wanted to explain her. But I found that when I was writing in her voice, it was a bit of a struggle for me. My mother always told me, you're just like your grandmother. You're just like my mom. And I think she didn't mean that as a compliment. But when I sat down <laughs> <laughs> when I sat down to write the book, I know exactly what she meant. Lily and I are motivated by the same things, whereas my mother's motivated by freedom and art and beauty and connection with animals. I want to make things better. There are rules. You've got to change things. And it was very easy for me to slip into Lily's voice. So I was intending to write Lily's story as the backstory, but I found that it was really outweighing. It was sort of overtaking um, my mother's story. And I could tell my mother's story and Lily's story both. Now, let's talk about your grandmother, Lily Casey Smith, or as the Times called her, a grandmother with a heap of gumption. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Which I love. We all we all should treasure whatever yeah. gumption we have. Yeah. Now, the story really is about her growing up in what was truly frontier at the time, yes, right? Yes. Turn of the century, yeah. uh, West Texas and New Mexico. Lily was born in 1901 in a dugout. I've told a couple of kids that, and they're all impressed that she could be born on a baseball field. No, uh, not a baseball field. Yeah. Dugout from the, the side of a river um, I think most people pit. today don't even know what a dugout yeah. is. You know, I mean, and, and I think that's a bit of a tragedy. Um, because I think one of the reasons that I wanted to tell Lily's story is because it is such an American story. And um, 
uh, in some ways, she's an amazing character. She was she was breaking horses at an age when most kids are being enrolled in first grade. She um she became a school teacher when she was 15 years old. She didn't yet have a high school diploma. She went on to sell bootleg lip, liquor, and she went on to run and with her husband a 180,000 acre ranch without electricity, um, without the, what we consider the modern conveniences. She was uh, she was a tough old broad, but in another way. Even though she's extraordinary, on another level, she's very, very ordinary, very common. She was a quintessential sort of American story, so much like everybody's grandmother or great-grandmother or grandfather who came over to this country to get away from the potato famine or the Holocaust or came over on slave ships and just did the hard work that needed to be done. She certainly had what it takes. I mean, this was truly a hard scrabble life. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, but she never felt sorry for herself. And that's one of the things that I love about her. And, you know, while I've been touring on, on behalf of the Glass Castle, so many people have said, you're so strong, I could have never survived what you did without indoor plumbing. How could you possibly have made it? And I'm very flattered by that. But the truth is, it's it's a little bit of bunk. We, we all are stronger than we realize. I just had the great blessing of having a really tough childhood. So I know that I can survive these things. But I think we all can survive whatever is thrown our way. Yeah. Now, they spent some time going back and forth between West Texas, where they lived on the mm -hmm. Pecos, mm -hmm. and a ranch in New Mexico. Yeah. And a lot of this had to do with family inheritance, right. unsettled land claims, typical American West Very disputes. typical. Absolutely. You know, back then, you could claim... Um, a, a, a nice little plot of land if you had what it took to clear it and settle it. And but but there became a lot of disputes over land and water. Water was so precious. And it's ironic that it's starting to become precious again and that there's shortages out in the West. But these people, they were so in touch with the land and the weather. But yeah, there was a lot of arguing and feuds going on about who owned what. And they were all the time battling not only each other over the land, but the elements, you know, tornadoes and flash floods and it was a tough life, um, and it's very easy to idealize it. And, um, you know, Lily very much fell in love with the future, with mechanization and modernization that made life easier. But I think in the process of that, you do lose something. For everything we gain, you lose a little something. And, you know, she fell in love with um, skyscrapers in Chicago, but it, that was never really who she was. Yeah. Now, her formal education was curtailed at about 13, yeah, right? but yeah. she somehow managed to hold a series of teaching jobs. Lily um, sort of saw, um, Lily, from Breaking the Horses, saw the sort of magic of, of transforming and taming not only animals, but also students. She fell in love with teaching, and she wanted to, she wanted to tame horses and critters and, and children and the land. Um, and and she she was a, a very gifted teacher, um, and she got her first job when she was fifteen, her first teaching job. And, and she, she had to uh, ride five hundred miles. Was five hundred miles on herself. her own, and in fact, um, that was so not extraordinary to her that my mother didn't even hear about that until she was a grown woman and there was some announcement of somebody traveling 500 miles on horse and Lily said what's the big deal about that I did that a number of times and told my mother this story at about 15 at 15 she got on the little horse patches and just traveled off and took a teaching job and it was no big deal for those times she sort of thought well you know you that's how you got around you just got on your horse and went to your job and um, but she got uh, she got the teaching job because most men uh, were off in, in Europe fighting the war, and uh, as soon as they came back, she lost her job. And it was a real struggle for her to get her high school diploma and then to go on and get her college education. But she realized how important that was for her, so she really struggled to get that. Um, but after that, she went back to the ranch and found that there really wasn't a place for her, which sent her off to the big city, yeah? Exactly. She went to Chicago to try to get her, her college ed education, or her high school education. After she got booted from her from her first teaching gigs, she went to Chicago and uh, she became a maid. Um, and it was it was a sort of a tough life. She sort of thought that she'd become a big city gal, but it never quite clicked for her. But she did go ahead and, and get her, her high school diploma and then came back to the West and started teaching again. Right, but there was a bit of a traumatic experience there with uh, what she called a 
crumb bum husband. There are a couple of unpleasantries, too. You know, as, as tough and shrewd as she was, she was also a little bit naive. And she ended up marrying somebody who was already married and had a family. Um, and it was it was quite a shocker for her. And I think that for a long time she didn't trust people because of that. So back to Arizona, teaching jobs, eventually finds another man who's... She found, really a good, good fella. She found a real salt of the earth guy. A real, he was a quintessential cowboy. You know, a bit of a throwback to the last century. Just the sort of um, laconic, um, a, a fascinating man in and of himself. One of fifty-two children. His his um, his parents were polygamists, but he was um, he was quite the rancher and really understood animals. And they ended up on a big ranch and ran the ranch together. What was it? One hundred and eighty thousand acres. One hundred and eighty thousand acres, just a lot of land. That's big, even by Western standards. Yeah. Yeah, it, yeah. it, it is. And um, you know, they they did it almost on their own. They had a couple of hands during the roundup. They would hire extra extra hands, very often Native Americans and just these these characters who were sort of um, semi-wild themselves, who just sort of lived going around and doing these roundups. And it was it was a very tough, but a, a tough life, but full of of a lot of beauty and freedom as well. Yeah. Now let's talk about your success a little bit with The Glass Castle. Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> came out in 2005, yes. got scads of glowing reviews. Did you ever, ever begin to think that we'd be sitting here talking about selling more than two million copies? Never, 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 never in my life. This has been such a shocker for me. I had to be practically duct taped into my desk to write that story. Um, it was something that I tried to do a number of times, and I was so ashamed of my past uh, that I was completely convinced that once people knew the truth about me, that I was going to be a, com a complete pariah. And the book might sell a couple of copies, but I felt it was something that I had to do because I felt like such a fraud and a phony. If everybody knew the truth about my little rough scrabble background, that uh, that they would have nothing but contempt for me. And I have learned so much from people, from readers, since the publication of my book, most, most specifically how wrong I was about people, how good and smart and compassionate they are, and how they're willing to to root for a kid from the wrong side of the tracks as long as I'm willing to be honest. But I think perhaps more significantly, how many people out there have stories of their own? Well, I think, yeah, the opposite of what you yeah. thought was going to happen, and, and it could be because of what I like to call the, the leave it to beaver effect, because is, we all see the images in the media of what a perfect American family can be. And think we should be that, exactly. but none of us really are. The number of people who've come up to me and said, you know, the details of our lives are different, but you and I have a lot in common, and they'll start telling me their stories. Very often they'll wait until the, the, rest, the rest of the crowd is gone. Um, and sometimes they had rough scrabble backgrounds like mine, but sometimes they were raised in great wealth, and they maybe had an alcoholic parent or a, a slightly loopy parent, and they'll... They'll start crying very often when they tell me their story, and they'll say, I'm so ashamed. I've never told anybody this before. And I think, why would you be ashamed? That's such a great story. And I think that very often we carry around these our past as, as though it's a burden. And what I've come to understand is that these things that we think are shameful are actually often our greatest source of, of strength and should be our greatest source of pride. And when you write about it and go out and tell your story in yeah. public, it makes it okay for other people to... It does. It. it does. A very wise person once told me, he said, secrets are a little bit like vampires. He said, they suck the, the life out of you, but they can exist only in the darkness. And once they're exposed to the light, there's the moment of horror when you see it. But then, poof, they lose their power over you. And I think that's very true. So after you've had all that success, which is kind of life-changing almost for you, was it intimidating then to sit down at the keyboard again and you write know, a new book? It's and, very How am I going to follow this up? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's very life-changing, but I have to say it's also humbling. Um, you know, to the contrary about it, it, it doesn't go to your head and, and make you more arrogant. It just makes you say, wow, people are good. And somebody asked me once, they said, do you feel that the knives are out for you? And I feel almost the opposite. I, I feel intimidated by people's belief in me. I just, I don't want to disappoint them. I, I want to deliver a story that they want to, to hear and that they want to read. And I, I, I hope I've done it. I hope, um, you know, in half-broke courses, it, it's, 
it's just my family story. I think what we do when we tell a story, whether it's a memoir or biography, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, is just this. This is my story. This is this is what I have to share with you. Um, you know, and especially with a memoir or biography, this is a life. Um, and I hope you can learn something from it without the nasty business of actually having to go through it all. Maybe you can connect with it on some way and learn something about somebody who grew up with a situation different than yours. Or maybe you can even learn something about yourself with it. And and that's my hope for, for Half Broke Horses. Thanks, Jeanette, for being with us on Off the Shelf today. For more information about Jeanette Walls and Half Broke Horses, visit www.simonandschuster.com.